Okay, today we're going to talk about strain gauges, um, kind of how they work, and we'll talk a little bit about how to measure the output of a strain gauge, but uh, actually we're going to have a separate video on bridge circuits, which is the real, the real way you want to go. That's coming up. So, what does a strain gauge do? It gauges strain. Okay. Um, how does it work? Well, let's... Let's, uh, let me click here. Basically, you take the uh, strain gauge itself, that's this little greenish colored thing here and a couple more examples over here, and you glue it to the surface that you're going to be straining or stretching or elongating. And as the, the base material strains, so does the strain gauge, and you can measure the... Um, effects of that strain in the strain gauge electrically and you know why the substrate is deforming it could be force pressure whatever it doesn't matter you're just measuring how much elongation happens underneath the surface so basically what happens in the strain gauge is the resistance of the device is a reasonably linear function of its deformation you have a for a met, um, metallic strain gauge you essentially have a piece of wire that just gets wound back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So as you strain it or stretch it like this, you get, um, you stretch those wires and the resistance of those wires change and you can measure the change in resistance. And that was just a change in length, you caught that. So that it's active along that way. If I stretch it this way, um, I don't really stretch those wires much so you don't get much indication of strain, and that's a good thing. If I need to measure strain in a couple of different directions, I can use a couple of strain gauges, but since they're, they're fairly directional, I can separate the strain in this direction from the strain in that direction if I use another strain gauge. So our input is whatever force, pressure, torque to some mechanical thing. It's going to elastically deform whatever we have the strain gauge glued to, that deformation deforms the strain gauge, and that results in a change in the resistance of that strain gauge. So what causes the resistance to change, and how does one measure resistance variation? Well, that's where we're going to go. So let's look at the um, strain gauge itself, and we can say that the resistance of the, if we assume that the resistance changes, we can say that the resistance at any point in time is the nominal resistance R0, so the gauge in relaxed state, plus some change in resistance. And we know that the resistance of a wire is the res resistivity, rho, um, the length of the wire, and the cross-sectional area of the wire. You know, this is a material property, and these are geometric properties. So we can um, essentially rewrite our delta R as the partial of resistance with respect to length times the delta length. So as I change the length, my resistance is going to change. The partial of resistance with respect to area times any change in area and the partial of resistance with respect to the resistivity times the delta resistivity. Okay putting all those together and substituting in, I get my delta R is the resistivity over the area times the change in length minus the resistivity times the length divided by area squared times the change in area. And basically, I'm just taking the partial derivatives of this and plugging them in over here. And the length over area times the uh, change in resistivity. And as we stretch these wires, really all, all these things happen at the same time. Um, you know, just like if I take a rubber band and if I stretch it, it gets longer and it gets skinnier, right? So I'm changing the length and I'm changing the cross-sectional area as well when I stretch it. Same thing happens to these wires. And the other thing that happens is I stretch it is I get a change in the resistivity or conductivity, depending on how you want to look at it, um, because I'm 
and it's material dependent. You know, some materials exhibit this strongly, some don't. But as you strain that wire, you strain the interfaces between the crystal boundaries, the boundaries between the crystals in that metallic substrate, and that affects how easily the electrons can flow, and it changes that resistivity. Typically, as you strain it, the resistivity goes up. So having taken the partial derivatives, substituted everything in from there, um, I can rearrange that and say that my change in resistivity over the base resistivity, <laughs> or change in resistance, I'm sorry, I'm using the water, change in resistance over the base resistance is equal to the change in the length over the base length minus change in area over the base area plus the change in resistivity over the base resistivity. Resistance and resistivity are just too close. And I can rewrite that as 1 plus 2 times V, where V is uh, Poisson's ratio. And that's the ratio of the transverse to the axial strain. So that's strain. So that's the, essentially the change in diameter versus change in length as you strain something. And epsilon is our strain. And that's, that's unitless because it's, and so is Poisson's ratio. Uh, it's basically, for example, centimeters per centimeter or delta centimeter per centimeter and, or, or delta inch per inch. So it's the change over the, um, the percent, the fraction change in length. So we got our equation is one plus two Poisson's ratio times the epsilon, the strain, plus the change in resistivity as a func over the base resistivity. So we can put those all together in a one simple number because they all tend to go together for any given material, which we define as the gauge factor. And our gauge factor is basically the change in resistance over the base resistance as a function of the strain. And if we substitute in here, we get with that equation, and we end up with simply our change in resistance over the base resistance is equal to this gauge factor, which is a constant based on, on, on all of this, um, times, times the actual strain. Okay? Well, not all of that, because the strain is out. <laughs> but it's a constant based on the material properties and um, in the geometry of the device. Obviously, you know, uh, the more, the more loops I have here in this, the more the, my gauge factor is going to increase because my change in length per given strain is, is going to be amplified because I'm changing it many more times. Okay. So what are values of gauge factors and things like that? Um, depends on the material. Like I said, there are two primary flavors are metallic strain gauges and semiconductor strain gauges. For metallic gauges, you get a strain factor of about 2 to 2.22, and we'll play with these numbers in a couple slides. A base resistance, 120 ohms, plus or minus an ohm, is not uncommon. They come in other values. You can get them up to kilo ohms as a base resistance. The resistance, the actual change in resistance as you strain it from end to end is, you know, on the order of 2.4 to 4.8, just, just a few ohms, not very many. Um, they don't take a lot of current, 15 milliamps, 100 milliamps, so they're a fairly low current device. Um, and one good thing about the metallic strain gauges is they're not very sensitive to temperature variation. They're, they all, that any conductor is going to vary with resistivity or conductance with temperature. Metallic uh, conductors are not too bad. Semiconductors change a lot with temperature, and that's the problem with those. Uh, semiconductor strain gauges, silicon doped with phosphorus, arsenic, or boron, all good healthy stuff, right? <laughs> um, yeah, but um, don't eat them, okay? Uh, gauge factors here, you know, they're about 20 times larger. Instead of being you know, on the order of two, they're on the order of 100. So um, the base resistances tend to be about the same. 
And the downside, you know, it's nice to get that much bigger signal, but the downside is they're sensitive to temperature change, and you have to somehow compensate for that. Different ways of doing it. One would just be to measure the temperature and calculate. Another way, when we get to bridge circuits, is you will put a uh, you arrange the bridge circuit with, with strain gauges in various places so that the effects of temperature actually just uh, cancel each other out. Um, so how do you measure resistance? Well, essentially the way a, a um, multimeter works, or you know, regular multimeter for re measuring resistance, is you have a voltage source, you have your resistance in series with that voltage source, and then you measure the current that flows through it and apply apply Ohm's law, and we get that the current is the voltage source divided by the resistance plus, in our case, is delta R, which represents the strain. And we can, we can juggle the math and draw this, but the bottom line here is that um, we have some problems if we want to do this. Uh, if we use a um, strain gauge like one of those metallic ones, if I assume that my Vs equals 5 volts, uh, my R0 equals 120 ohms, my delta R equals 4, with no strain I measure 8.3 milliamps, and with the strain applied I get you know 8.1 milliamps. So it's not much change in the amperage as a function of that um, strain. Plus, I have this big offset. I'm starting out at around 8 milliamps. Okay. Um, I can use a constant current source and measure the voltage variation, much like it's just applying Ohm's law rearranged. And here, using my numbers again, let me finish the animations. I think that's everything. Um, if I have a 10 milliamp source and I use the same gauge as above, I get 1.20 volts in one case and 1.24 volts in the other. So I'm looking for, you know, 0 0.04 change in voltage out of a 1.2 voltage um, baseline, you know, hooking this up to an A to D converter you're going to get more noise than anything else because you're just it's just not going to work. You know, if you're trying to put that into a, um, a digital acquisition system. Um, I can also, uh, you know, put it in a voltage divider circuit, which which helps a little bit. But um, in this circuit, let me just put the math up here. My voltage output is basically a function of both of these resistors because, you know, in Kirchhoff's voltage law, I've got a voltage through here and I uh, VR1 plus VR0 plus delta R uh, equals my voltage source. So I can rearrange all that and I get, I get this equation for my output voltage across that. And if our delta R is much smaller than the base resistance, which we know that it is, we can simplify the equation a little bit to look like this. Uh, I can plug that in. And I, oops, and I get a little better results, but even so, um, let me give you real numbers. If we, again, we assume Vs equals 5, R equals 120, um, our delta R equals 4, I get a difference between 2.583 volts and 2.500 volts. There's not much signal there. It's, it's, it's nicely linear, which is a good thing. This, this bias here, you know, like in this case, this 2.5 volt bias um, makes it really difficult to work with. Uh, you get a small difference between, you know, moderately sized numbers that make things difficult to work with. So obviously, there's got to be a better way, right? I mean, there just has to be. And it turns out that there is. Um, and in the next video, we'll talk about Wheatstone Bridge Circuit.
and those have a lot of nice properties that essentially get rid of this bias and leave us with just a change in voltage around zero that we can easily amplify and work with, and life is much better. So, I hope that was interesting, or at least didn't put you to sleep. Maybe it didn't talk long enough to put you to sleep. That's it. Thanks. Bye.